This episode is presented by Athletic Greens. More on that later. Today we're going to be building this modern cantilevered coffee table out of mostly walnut hardwood and actually have a lot to say about it when it comes to the design and structure. That said, there's going to be a lot of work to do, so let's just start building and then we'll talk about those specifics as they come up. All right, so going into this one, I knew that I was going to encounter two major hurdles with the build, and the first had to do with materials. I guess the easiest way to put it is the walnut that I'm using for this piece just kind of sucked. There were really only a few spots where I could get more homogenous looking figuring or grain, and normally the way around this is you end up essentially wasting or hiding the quote unquote uglier pieces, but here that wasn't really an option. So the best that I could do was try to make my prettiest sections the outside faces of what'll become the front and back sub-assemblies. And the second hurdle has to do with the overall design. What I mean by that is typically whenever you design something, you kind of tiptoe towards the edge of what you think the limitations are. But here, I pretty much threw caution to the wind. So I came up with lots of iterations prior to settling on one. But really, they were all variations on the same idea of a long, open-ended, cantilevered shape. Basically, a trapezoid, but you eliminate one of the vertical-ish sides. But then, after finally landing on one, I got cold feet. Now, I'm no stranger to this kind of shape. I think the most obvious comparison would be the ottoman that we designed to go with our Glen Lounge chair plans. And as you can see in this shot here, it turned out way stronger than we would have imagined. That said, even though the wood that we're using is slightly thicker, and these joints are significantly longer, I don't think you need to be a structural engineer, which I'm most certainly not, to know that thanks to how long this span is in comparison, they have the potential to be subject to much more destructive forces. So because of that, I started compromising and tried out ideas like this, which would equate to using a bracket, and other ideas like an inset box. But at the end of the day, they weren't really what I wanted to build, so I thought, screw it. Let's build the version that might not work, and if it doesn't, I'll learn from it and be a better person for it. So with all that out of the way, now let's get back to building it and see if it actually works out. So with all of my chunks cut out and extremely oversized at this point, the next step, as you probably guessed, was milling. And we'll start off over at the joiner to get one nice flat face on all of our boards. And then we can head over to the planer to create a smooth face on the opposite side and simultaneously bring all of our pieces down to a uniform thickness, which for me ended up being just a hair over an inch and a half thick. And this was coming from boards that started life in my shop at an inch and seven eighths thick. So in the milling process, we lost about three eighths of an inch or for my friends in the rest of the world, other than Liberia and Myanmar this many millimeters. But anyway, by the time I was through with all of that, it was pretty much time to leave for the day. So the last thing that I did before heading home was fill some knot holes with black tinted epoxy, as well as this, I guess the euphemism would be live edge, but let's be real, it's more like a missing corner. As I said, material was a hurdle with this one. But I could let that set up overnight so that first thing in the morning, I could use my joiner to establish one nice flat edge on each of my pieces. So in this shot, you can see the piece that was probably the worst offender of the bunch. And the faster way to take care of a piece like this would be to establish a mostly straight edge on a bandsaw and then finish it off on the joiner. That said, I thought it would be a good exaggerated example of what the joiner is actually doing. So I went ahead and cleaned up the whole thing here. So in this shot, you can see that the piece is touching the joiner bed on the two ends, and then it's almost comically high above the cutter head at the center. But each time I take a pass, it removes and flattens material here, and you just kind of creep up on a nice flat edge. And in this sped up clip that actually lasted 14 minutes, you can see that with each pass, I'm getting closer and closer to the clean edge that I need. Now, I know that to the more experienced people watching this, you probably already know all of this, but I also know that a lot of people watching are newer to woodworking, so I thought it would be good to include. And actually, if you are newer to woodworking, and maybe you mostly watch these videos for entertainment or inspiration, and you're looking for something that's a little more tailored towards expanding your current skill set, go check out the Craig Academy. 
I personally worked with them, so I can vouch for it. I built three of the six projects that they cover, which are a workbench, a shoe bench, and a coffee table. And in addition to those projects, there's three others, plus a whole skills library and way more than I can list here. But the bottom line is it's tailor made for people who are newer to woodworking and looking to take their skills to the next level. So I'm going to throw a link in the description. And if you do sign up, just let them know that I sent you. Okay, so as you just saw, after jointing an initial edge on a few of the pieces, I used my table saw to cut a flat edge on the opposite side. And you also might have noticed this template piece that I was referencing when I was doing the joiner demonstration. So let's talk about that for a second. So in order to make our eventual shapes, we're going to be using three templates. And this is something that we've covered a bunch of times. In fact, this coffee table is really inspired by a DIY coffee table that I made a couple months ago where I had to hand make templates by drawing and printing on paper and then basically just cutting the line. So if you want more information about making templates, I'm going to link that video as well as another one where Sean covers this concept in even more detail in the description. So you can go check those out. That said, while it's definitely very doable, as we've demonstrated plenty of times, I don't think there's really any arguing that if you do have the ability to make templates on a CNC, it's obviously faster. So I'm going to use my Xcarve Pro to take care of the templates for this one. But regardless of how you get your templates, in the next steps, we're going to start utilizing them. So here I'm tracing my final shapes onto my work pieces so that I can start cutting my joint faces. So after marking everything up, the first thing I'll do is use the bandsaw to cut what will become the vertical pieces into individual chunks. Then from there, we can head over to the table saw to cut our joint faces. And in this shot, now you'll see why establishing that flat edge was so important. So you could do this on a miter saw or something like this Rockler crosscut sled that you see here. But the basic idea is we'll use our flat edge as our registration surface and use our templates to dial in the proper angle. And actually of the three pieces that we need to cut, this little vertical one is the most complex because it has two crucial cuts. Whereas the longer top and bottom pieces only have one crucial cut. So what we'll need to do is make the first cut on all of our pieces. Then we would reestablish the second angle that we needed on the opposite side and also set up a stop lock so that all of our pieces come out to a consistent finished length. And like I said, you can do this on a sled like you see here or a miter saw, but I'm going to show how to do it on a table saw with a quick plywood sled. So we have a few of these sleds that we keep sitting around and we'll basically just use them until they're too small to be useful anymore. But what I'm doing in this shot is locking my fence down in place and establishing a new cut edge on the sled. Next, I can use my template and align one of the joint faces so that it's perfectly flush with the cutting edge on my sled and clamp it in place. Then I'm going to screw down another piece of scrap plywood which will hold my workpiece at the proper angle to make the cut. And since there was no real good way to clamp this to hold it in place while I made the cut, I made this quick little bridge jig that will hold my workpiece in place so that I can keep my hands focused on controlling the sled rather than holding the workpiece. So with that all set up, next we can make this cut on all of our vertical pieces. After making the final cut, next we can alter our setup so that we can cut the proper angle on the opposite side of our vertical piece. And this is pretty much the same process, the only difference being that now finished length is also crucial. So what I'll do is add a second scrap piece of plywood that's going to act as a stop to make sure that each piece comes out to an identical length. And then again we can cut all of those joint faces. So from here it's really the same process to cut the joint faces on the top and bottom pieces of our assembly. Only that it's actually easier since we're only concerned with establishing the proper angle at this point and the opposite ends are just left long. And again if you've got a great miter saw setup you could use that to take care of this. Now at this point all of our work pieces are still way oversized. They're pretty much nice along these edges but still rough along these edges. That said, we're not going to bother refining anything yet, and instead we can go ahead and glue them up into our sub-assemblies. And to do that, I'm going to use my template to mark exactly where I want the inside radius of my finished pieces to go, 
and then use that to make sure that I don't accidentally cut a domino somewhere that it's going to be exposed. And I'm going to be using two 10 by 50 dominoes at each joint. That said, dowels or really anything else that you like would also work here. And you could certainly load it up with more than two if you like, but I'm going to go with two. All right, while our sub assemblies are drying, let's quickly knock out the base. And this is going to be pretty simple since you're not really going to be able to see it in the finished piece. That said, we don't want to make it a total afterthought and we still want to give it a little bit of design. So as you can see in this shot, it's basically just a double cross shape. And I'm not sure if that's a proper term, so maybe a half hashtag. Either way, this shape. And it'll be joined by a few cross lap joints. Okay, so after milling all of these pieces, ripping them to their finished widths and leaving them a little bit long, I'm actually going to use two woodworking tricks that we covered in our new series, Tips and Tricks That Every Woodworker Should Know, which I'll link in the description. And these are going to help me dial in the exact perfect height setting for my blade, as well as help me to cut the dados in my workpiece to the exact perfect width. So I'm not going to go into detail on that here since it would take me about 8 minutes just to explain this part. But if you want to learn more about that, or just tips in general, definitely check out that series which we're going to be expanding on soon. And the only other thing that I'll say about this space specifically for now is remember that we had left the pieces long back when we originally cut our joinery. And the reason for that is that it's a lot easier to cut in the joinery than cut the piece to length as opposed to cutting the piece to length and then trying to perfectly position the joinery where you want it. I mean. On this piece, it probably wouldn't make that much of a difference, honestly, but there are times that that is true, so I just like to keep my workflow consistent. Oh, hey, you caught me drawn again. So while I'm doing that, why don't we take a second to thank this week's sponsor, Athletic Greens, and I'll tell you about them while I draw. So AG1 by Athletic Greens is a daily supplement that has 75 different ingredients, including vitamins, minerals, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. Now, obviously, there's never a bad time to make a change for the better, but this is a pretty easy one that you can actually stick to. So here's what I personally like about AG1. I'm what you might call not a great eater. I'm no stranger to burgers and fries. And yeah, I, I like to mix in a salad here and there, but I could be better. Well, drinking AG1 has actually kind of changed that for me. It's easy, convenient, and rather than being something restrictive, it's something that I've added to my morning routine. I've made it my habit to mix one scoop of AG1 powder into 10 ounces or so of water as I head out the door. And like I said, it's been a change for the better. There's tons of benefits, things like feeling a boost in energy, but the thing that I personally like the most is I don't feel that late morning hunger anymore. Now, that could be because AG1 has pre and probiotics that help with digestion and better gut health. Now, you might be thinking, that sounds great and all, but... I'm not going to drink that green slurry, and I get it, but it's actually good. If you can imagine a sort of subtle, slightly fruity iced tea flavor, that's what it tastes like. And when I think about all the benefits, I actually look forward to drinking it each morning. So that's how I'm getting my greens, and if you want to get your greens, go to athleticgreens.com slash four eyes to get started on your order. Athletic Greens is going to give my community a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All right, thanks, Athletic Greens. And I'm also done with this drawing now, and I'm kind of regretting some of the decisions I made, but I'm halfway through building it, so I guess I might as well finish it. All right, so when we last saw our sub-assemblies, they were getting glued up, and by now they should be dry, so we can continue working on them. So the first thing that I'll do is get that crosscut sled and set the angle to 15 degrees, which is this angle. And by the way, you could use that same plywood sled for this that we used before. But anyway, we'll use that to clean up the back edge of our pieces. Next, we'll mark out the final shape onto each piece and then take it over to the bandsaw and remove the bulk of the material, making sure that we stay just to the outside of our marker line. And you can see here that my blade was way too wide to cut this arc, so instead I just did a bunch of relief cuts, which isn't pretty, but it gets a job done and won't really make a difference in the final product. Mm -hmm. 
So here we've already got clean edges all around the outside perimeter, so we're really just routing the inside perimeter now. And we're also not going to cut the tips just yet, as the end grain doesn't really take well to a router, so we're going to handle those in a minute. But as you can see, once you've established a ledge with your templates, you can remove them and use the bearing on your bit to reference that ledge to work your way down the piece. And we'll just keep doing this for several passes, going all the way down until there's just a small ledge left. And then I'll remove the last little bit by switching to a flush trim bit. And you can do this handheld or on a router table, which I guess is true for the previous step as well. But regardless, after doing that, we could take care of the tips of our pieces, and we'll just use that crosscut sled once again with the same 15 degree angle still dialed in to lop off the ends. All right, now a few of you eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed an inconsistency. So way back whenever I initially made my templates, you'll recall that they were made from quarter inch MDF, but then a minute ago when I was template routing, all of a sudden I was using three quarter inch plywood. Well, here's why. So in a lot of ways, this piece is turning out to be the kind of exact opposite of the desk that we built in the last video, where that was for a client, so there couldn't be any surprises. They had an expectation, we had to meet that expectation, which meant wasting a lot of material and just going about things a different way. This piece, the main struggle that I'm having is with material limitations. Uh, the way that that's going to be most obvious in the finished piece is that I basically need six of this repeating shape in order to complete the project, but I only have enough material for five of the piece, so obviously I'm going to have to get creative there. I got an idea that I think is actually going to be pretty cool. I'm sure some people are going to hate it. They've maybe already seen it in the finished thumbnail. I think it's going to be cool. I hope it's going to be cool. I guess we'll Okay, so as you've likely cool. guessed by now, that idea that people are either going to love or hate is making five of the slats out of walnut hardwood and one of the slats out of plywood. A sort of nod to the idea of wabi-sabi. At least that's what I'm going to tell myself. Now, I could have used the exact same workflow that I used on the walnut to do this, but instead of doing that, I just cut myself a chunk of plywood and routed out the entire shape on the X carve. Actually, two of the entire shape. The way I could laminate them together and end up with a six slat that matched the inch and a half thickness of the other pieces. Okay, so now that we're back up to speed and I've got all six of the pieces that I'm gonna need, I'm gonna line them up and clamp them together and then just do some aggressive sanding to put the small curves that I need onto the back edges and the tips of the slats. And then we could get to work on what was for me by far the hardest part of this build, which was figuring out how we're gonna assemble everything. So again here, I had lots of ideas and designs, but the one that I eventually settled on was using some three quarter inch walnut dowel. So the most obvious approach might be doing something like this, where you drill holes all the way through the slats and then basically make kind of like a shish kebab table, but I didn't want to do that for a few reasons. One, I wouldn't have a good way to ensure that the gap between each of the slats ended up equal to the others. Two, even if I did, this kind of assembly would get really messy. And three, I'm violently allergic to shish kebabs. Not really. But anyway, what I ended up doing was instead of drilling all the way through, I made a bunch of half inch deep mortises that the dowels could sit in. And then if I were to cut the dowels to two inches long, I'd end up with consistent one inch gaps everywhere and a much cleaner glue up. And less vomiting. Again, not really. Okay, so with part of the game plan figured out, next I needed to figure out how I was gonna make sure that I cut all 120 of my mortises in the right enough location that I'd actually be able to bring everything together. So since I already had the SVG file set up, I decided to cut out another piece on the X-Carve, but this time with seven little pilot holes carved in as well. So it's basically kind of like a story stick. And this is definitely overkill. You could just make something like this by creating one more shape out of plywood and then drilling the holes through, but it was already set up, so I figured what the hey. Now, I also played around with a few ways that I could cut the mortises, and it turns out that the pattern bit that was already in the router cut perfectly sized mortises. But there was one problem. The blades on the tip of the bit don't extend all the way to the center, so you can't just plunge down however deep you want. 
basically the center of the bit bottoms out very quickly and what you're left with is this sort of ring shape. So to combat that, I would attach the story stick, drill a pilot hole all the way through my slat and then enlarge it with a few more bits. And then after that was done, I could come back and cut my mortises with the router. So this turned out to be not as hard as I feared, but definitely as laborious as I feared, maybe more. Actually, here's a shot of me completing one of the six slats in real time, only sped up, and this clip is 28 minutes long. So basically it was a solid three hours of doing the same thing over and over. Really the only part that was a slight change of pace, though it wasn't a fun one, was that for the outside slats, with the initial holes I drilled, they couldn't go all the way through. So instead I set a depth on my portable drill guide and then proceeded that way. And technically I could have done this for all the slots, but then I would need to drill from both sides rather than just one side. For the actual assembly, there was no way that I was going to try to do everything in one shot, so instead I broke it up into parts. But the basic approach was glue dowels into one side, then put glue in the mortises of the next slat and attach them together. So I started off by making two of those, then about an hour later I added a third layer to each stack, and then another hour later went ahead and put the two halves together. All right, while I'm putting the finishing touches on this one, I'd like to invite you once more to check out our woodworking plans if you're interested in building something. We honestly work super hard on them, and I think that it shows. Each one has long format, chapterized videos to explain every step, all the dimensions you could want, and a lot more. So if you're interested in building something, give them a look and know that it's appreciated. As for this one, Obviously it won't be a plan, and a lot of the reason for that was it was just too experimental, especially in terms of the strength thing. But on that note, while I certainly wouldn't stand on it or probably even sit on it, it turned out to be stronger than I expected it to be. Certainly strong enough to set a coffee or some remotes and magazines on. So yeah, in more ways than one, I guess you could say that it is flawed or imperfect. But in that imperfection, I think I've found the perfect name for this table. So ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the Wabi Sabi Shish Kebabi table. I'll show myself out. But before I do, and with all sincerity, special thanks to all of my Patreon members for helping me to make these videos possible. I know I say it in every video, but I mean it. So again, thank you. I couldn't do it without you. And if you're liking these videos and want to find out more about how you can support the show, get a 4 Ice t-shirt, a Field Notes booklet, and even discounts on our plans, check out the link in the description. And as always, no pressure. And either way, we'll see you in the next one.